I'm waiting for Facebook to come up. I think it's already up. And I think it comes up before it says it does. All right, there we go. Prophet David Terry here for your live, a weekly live prophetic word. Uh, thank you to all of you that are joining me live. Thank you to all of you that are listening on the podcast. Thank you to all of you that are you know, watching on Periscope and all of you that will watch on YouTube. And just thank you so much. Uh, God bless you. You know, you hear me say it every week that I feel honored to be used of God to release his prophetic word. So let's jump right on in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your steadfastness and your faithfulness. Thank you for your mighty word. Thank you for your mighty spirit. And thank you for the mighty blood and name of Jesus. I ask you to uh, speak through me, O oh God. Breathe through me. I surrender. I die to myself so that you might come alive through me and let the words be spoken that you once spoke them. We thank you for it. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Just a quick aside, uh, Bishop Jakes this morning talked about uh, going back to some of your old school stuff and anointing your home with consecrated oil. So those of you who may not know what consecrated oil or blessed oil is, it's when you would bring some type of oil, normally olive oil, to the man or woman of God they would lay their hands on it and bless it, and the anointing of God would then be in the oil. So you don't use that oil for everyday use. It's, not, it's no longer common oil, but you use it to anoint yourself for healing, anoint your child or your family members for healing, but also to anoint your home and speak Psalm 91. So you need to get some consecrated oil, get some oil blessed by a man or woman of God, and then go through all your doorposts, all your entryways to your home, and anoint it and put the oil of God on it and speak Psalm 91 that God's going to, going to deliver you from the snare of the father from the noise and pestilence and tell the devil that he has no authority to come into your home as you're anointing it with that holy oil. Okay, very, very important during this time. Okay, just like they had to plead the blood in the first Passover so that the angel of death that was killing the firstborn would pass over them. So we need to plead the blood and anoint our doorposts with oil and claim God's word and tell the devil that he and his sickness and his plague and his pestilence and his disease has no power over us and has no authority over us and has no place in our house. So I hope that the children of God take that seriously because we have that authority. That's why we have the scriptures. That's why we have the name of Jesus. That's why we have the shed blood of Jesus to use it as our defense against the devil so again i hope you take that seriously and i hope you anoint every place that you dwell with consecrated oil and speak psalm 91 over it and tell the devil he has no authority to bring his plague or his disease or his sickness or anything like that in your dwelling okay so that's not the prophetic word for today that was just a little aside the prophetic word for today is due season okay it's due season uh and that's a very familiar scripture but hopefully we'll see some of the new things that the spirit of god wants to give to us today okay so we're going to go to galatians chapter 6 verse 9. galatians chapter 6 verse 9 galatians is one of the pauline epistles by pauline epistles i mean the apostle paul wrote this the word epistle is another word for a letter so this is one of the letters that the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote to the church at Galatia. That's why it's called Galatians. Okay? So we're going to key in on verse 9, but let's look at verses 8, 9, and 10. I'm reading out of the Berean Study Bible, but I'm going to read a couple versions. So Galatians 6, 8. The one who sows to please his flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to the family of faith. Man, those verses are loaded. Uh, it reminds me of a reference verse, Psalm 126.5, that those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. <laughs> okay, so let's look at verse 8. The one who sows to please his flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. So once again, this is the New Testament. Huh, this is why I do my No More Genie series. Once again, 
when you get saved, the new nature of God comes in you. Your spirit gets reborn, but the old nature does not actually go away. That old nature is called the flesh. It's not talking about your body. It's talking about the nature that Adam and Eve created when they listened to the devil and sinned against God and became separate from God. They did so by lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So God had given them plenty of food to eat, but they desired the one thing. He said no. They saw it and they wanted it. Uh, they had no need for anything, but lust is inordinate desire. So in other words, I got plenty of food, but I'm, I'm going to eat that food anyway when we overeat and get into gluttony. And the pride of life. And pride is the opposite of love. Everything that love is, pride is the opposite of that. Love is patient. Pride is impatient. Love is kind. Pride is cruel. Love does not seek its own. Pride is only thinking about itself. Love believes all things. Pride don't believe nothing. Love hopes all things. Pride is cynical. You see that? Well, that's what Adam and Eve walked in the day that they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and separated from God and they died. In that act and in that moment was born the flesh nature. Again, that's not talking about your body. It's talking about that nature that is the opposite of God. So when we were created, we were one with God and everything about us was like God. But the devil came and convinced Eve that she could have more if she got into sin. And she believed that. And then Adam knew that wasn't right, but followed her. And then they created the flesh nature. That's why we're so rebellious, because the flesh, flesh nature was born in rebellion. It was born from listening to the devil. It was born by going against what God said and choosing death instead of staying over on the life side. That's when it happened the day they ate that fruit. And because all of humanity was in Adam's loins, God had told them to populate the planet to be fruitful and multiply. So because all of us were in potential in Adam's loins, then when he became corrupted, all of humanity came, became corrupted and that's why we're born sinners. So remember to never blame God for that because I know the devil and many times people all of the sin and the problems and the pain and the anger and the frustration that you feel in life, it doesn't come from God. It came from sin because this was not the conditions that God created the world in or gave the world to Adam like this. They sinned and then all this happened. That's why we grow. That's why we die. Rape, cancer, divorce, domestic violence, racism, you name it. All the things that plague us as people, it happened the day they sinned. So that flesh nature is now a part of our experience as humans. We are now born with it. And when you get saved, the new nature comes uh, into you. Your spirit gets recreated and comes alive again to God. But you must feed it. You feed it with the word of God. You feed it by time in God's presence with prayer and praise and worship. Fellowship with God. You, you feed it uh, by the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit. And you feed it by fellowshipping with other believers. So right now, we can only fellowship online, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, uh, when we could get together and when we'll be able to get together again, you also feed your inner man by fellowshipping with the saints. Okay? So the Bible says the one who sows to please his flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. So that... Old nature is still there, and it's still rebellious against God, and everything that it produces produces death. So it's still there. So the Bible says if we sow to it, we, flee, we flee, reap from it destruction. But if we sow to please the spirit, the inner man, the, the image of God that is now in us, that can be filled with the word and the spirit, from that we reap eternal life. So from uh, again, from that point, I want to help Christians understand that you do not become automatically perfected the day you get saved, but rather you have to grow into that new man the same way your physical body grows into your physical self, the same way your spiritual man has to grow into your spiritual self. So stop listening to these people that tell you that just because you're not perfect or you're struggling that you're not saved. That's not true. Okay? That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. There is no perfection in this life. There's just growth. Every year you can grow. Every year you can get better. Every year you can know more of God and you can die to self more and let Christ have his ascendancy in your life and be more like Jesus every year. But the, the perfection only happens 
in the glory realm because when our spirits go to the glory realm god sends us to one more round of fire and burns off anything from this life or from the flesh that doesn't belong to his kingdom and that's the final purging before we enter the pearly gates so there is no perfection in this life but there is growth okay and you can take a class and graduate and take a course and graduate and go higher and higher and higher as you walk this earth so i stop by that in the context of the prophetic word stop by today to tell you to not be discouraged if you're struggling or if you're if you say things to yourself like i shouldn't be feeling that way because i'm a christian you have to acknowledge that you do feel that way it's okay god still loves you his love for you will not change you have to acknowledge how you feel and then uh, make a choice based on god's word and ask god to give you grace to make a choice based on his word and not based on your flesh because we don't want to reap the harvest that comes with the flesh because that's just destruction you see that uh, I'm going to skip to verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's, let us do good to everyone, especially to the family of faith, as we have opportunity. So as opportunities pre present themselves in life, the chances for us to do good, for us to sow, sow, okay? So if you notice that these three verses are all about sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. So let's look at verse 9. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Okay, the first line of that sentence says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. That means we can grow weary in well-doing. Do you know why? Number one, because this is a faith walk, meaning that you have to believe God with no sensory evidence around you. And if you want an example of what that would look like, that would be Noah in the Bible. Noah had to build that ark with no rain in sight. And everybody looking at what he was doing and telling him that he was crazy. What would it look like if you built basically a submarine made out of wood in your backyard big enough to house all those animals in your family? Okay, so Noah had to do that with no sensory evidence, no, nothing, you know, sight, smell, sound, taste, touch, nothing telling him that it was raining or rain was even coming. And he had to do that because God said so. Okay, that's what that means. So you know that Noah had to have some long days sometimes. You know, at some point, Noah had to be like, what am I doing this for out here? I know I look crazy. But praise God, he didn't give up because if he had given up, then humanity would have not been saved. And we all would have been wiped out in the flood. Mm. So uh, that's an example in the scripture. Another example in the scripture is Christ on the cross. Uh, King David prophesied and said, thou will not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That was talking about Jesus. Uh, in other words, Jesus had to believe that Father, that if he gave his life and he died, Father wasn't going to leave him in hell, because after the Lord died, his spirit went down to hell and preached to all the people that were in the lower parts of the earth, people that had died in faith before he walked the earth as a man. So Jesus had to die in faith with that brutal uh, arrest and that brutal beating and that brutal death. He had to believe that if he went through with it, Father God was not going to leave him in hell nor allow his body to corrupt. In other words, Jesus' body did not decay even though it was dead, which is a trip if you think about it. He died, but rigor mortis didn't set in and he didn't turn blue. And none of the things that happen after our bodies die happen to Jesus' body if you didn't know that. Because the Bible says you will not let the Holy One see corruption. Do you know why it didn't happen to Jesus' body? Number one, because Father promised him that. But number two, because none of the sins that Jesus died for were his own. Therefore, his body was not ever corrupted by sin, even though he became sin on the cross. It was our sins, not his. Okay? So, <clears throat> Jesus had to die in faith. That's my point there. That there was literally nothing good about what was happening. Everything else happening to him was a nightmare scenario. Christ on the cross. But he still had to believe that Father God was going to be good to his promise, not let his body be corrupt and pull him back up out of hell. And he did. Praise and glory to his name. So it says, let us not grow weary in well-doing. So the number one reason we grow weary is because this is a faith walk and your senses, there may not be any sensory evidence. Number two is because you don't always necessarily know when due season is. Okay. Because it says in the Brian Study Bible, for in due time we will reap a harvest 
in uh, King James it says, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. New King James says, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. English Standard Version says, for in due season we will reap uh, if we do not give up. English Standard Version. So the challenge there is that we don't always know when the season is, but the Lord taught me something. And the Lord taught me that there are many seasons and many opportunities that God has already given us that we missed or that we blew it. So sometimes we have this picture in our minds of this big, this big dramatic payoff, you know, like Joseph got or maybe like Job got. But that may happen or that may not happen. It might happen one step at a time. It might happen one opportunity at a time because Joseph went to the extreme. Joseph was a Hebrew slave in prison and prison back then was not penitentiaries like we have. They were like literally holes in the ground. So he was down in the ground. Uh, just what that would do to your mind. Uh, so anyway, so uh, Joseph went from the pit to the palace in one day. And we like to preach about that because it's so spectacular and it's so awesome. But what if it doesn't happen that way for you? Because remember what I say all the time, don't take an experience and make it a doctrine. Just because Job had that experience, that's not a doctrine. Everybody's not going to experience what Job did. Some people will, but everybody's not going to look like that. Everybody's not going to experience what Joseph did. Some people will, but everybody's not going to look like that. So don't take an experience. We're supposed to learn from their experience, but don't take an experience and make it a doctrine. Okay? Don't make it a doctrine. Don't make it be something where you try to say it has to happen this way for everybody or else it ain't God or they ain't saved. That's not, oh, that's not true. That's not true. It's like that, they always say that prophecy is about prognostication, which is telling the future. That's not true. Prophecy, that word means to speak by divinely inspired utterance. It means to speak by the moving of the Holy Ghost. Uh, prognostication, telling the future, is a subset of prophecy. It's not all that prophecy is because John the Baptist, the greatest man that ever lived, never prophesied about the future. He prophesied about the present. His message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is, is at hand. His assignment was to tell the people around him that Jesus, the Lamb of God, is on earth right now. And you need to get yourself together for an encounter with him because he's here right now. That was John the Baptist's message. He never foretold the future. You see what I mean? So I'm saying all that to say that we don't always know when our season is, but the Lord has shown me that there have been opportunities and open doors that we have missed because we weren't busy preparing. So I've heard more sermons in my life about people saying, you know, you got to wait on God and wait on the Lord and they that wait and wait on Jesus. And I've heard that my whole life. But I've heard very few, if any, sermons about telling people about what you're supposed to do in the meantime and to don't get the idea in your head that the big payoff is the only payoff. How do you know, because I just met somebody on LinkedIn today, how do you know when you meet someone that that relationship won't bloom and grow into something that blesses your life? Because that might take years. That might take years. It might take years. But how do you know when you meet someone what's going to happen further down the road? So like the Bible says, if you have opportunity, do good to them. Treat them well, treat them with love, treat them the way you want to be treated. You never know where those seeds are going to go. But sometimes, again, we look for the big, dramatic Joseph moment where we're in jail and in obscurity and nobody knows who we are. The next thing we know, we blow up and we're all famous and Pharaoh knows who we are. And we're you know, vice chancellor of Egypt in charge of all agriculture and blah, 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 blah. And it might not happen like that. It may but it might not. It might be one opportunity at a time. And I have discovered, and the Lord has taught me, that we have missed many opportunities looking for the big one. And so, again, I told you I heard all this stuff about waiting on God. But I stopped by to tell you today that no, we don't know when due season is. But what we do know is that we need to be ready. I talked about this on No More Genies on Friday, that when the bridegroom comes, you need to be ready whenever that is. So let me give you some practical examples. If you've been, because this has happened to me, if you've been putting off writing a book and then one day you see a commercial or a TV show or a movie or something that fits perfectly with the, your idea for a book, but you didn't have that book in your hand because you didn't write it. You thought to write it, but you never got around to, around to it. You procrastinated. 
now fortunately i can say that in some cases i did have my book ready i did write it so i was able to capitalize and in some cases i still have a lot of stuff still to write but if you've been sitting around sitting on your talent sitting on your gift sitting on the opportunities that you have even in this time of corona even in this time of isolation which has been rough in the time of you know wearing a mask and all this different kind of stuff we've had time to be introspective time to pick up an instrument, time to write a book, time to reflect on your life, time to regroup, a whole bunch of things. See, so there's opportunities that God gives us all the time, but they don't always look like we thought, which is why we have to get rid of that big payoff picture and why we need to walk by faith. So the Bible says for in due time, in due season, we will reap a harvest, but it doesn't necessarily say when that season of that harvest might be. But again, instead of preaching, wait on Jesus, which is what I heard most of my life, Instead, what I'm saying is work on your skills, work on your management, work on your time management, work on your money management, work on your relationship management, work on an opportunity to make yourself better in the areas of your life so that what if God brings you an opportunity tomorrow, but you haven't been working on your attitude and you meet somebody and you snap on them. Well, there goes that opportunity that could have one day grown into your big harvest but because you haven't been working on treating people well you missed it what if like i said the example with a book or a song or anything that god has dropped into your spirit are you working on developing it because the day is going to come where something's going to happen where you're going to meet someone and what you've created is a perfect dovetail for what they need but that opportunity is going to pass you by if you've never created it <laughs> If you never put it out there, then there's no way it can bless you. Do you see what I mean? So that's what I mean when I say don't get as hung up on when is my harvest or when is my season because they're always eventually going to come the same way summer always eventually comes because I'm from Chicago, okay? So our winters have been super mild in the past several years. But if you know anything about classic Chicago winters, they were terrible. Classic Chicago winters, man, were always super cold, and they always felt like they were super long, and it didn't feel like we, we were ever going to get out of winter. Because in Chicago, it's not the temperature, it's the wind. That's why they call it the Windy City, because we have the wind coming off the lake. And that wind cuts through everything, cuts through your clothes, cuts through your gloves. It's, it's something else. It's been very mild for the last several years, but I'm talking about back before, you know, uh, in the 20th century in Chicago winters, boy, if you could make it through Chicago winter, you can make it anywhere. And just last year, if you remember, it was colder than Antarctica in Chicago in just two days, but we were literally the coldest place on earth. So I'm saying all that to say, when you're in a situation like that, sorry, you feel like summer's never coming. You feel like it's cold and it's going to stay cold. It's always going to be cold, but that's not true because summer always eventually comes, okay? So I'm saying that to say that so does the harvest season, season come, so does due season come, so does the time that you want comes, but if you haven't been working on your stuff, you're not gonna be ready when it does show up. And that's just as important as patience. Uh, have patience while you work, okay? Uh, 2015, the summer of 2015 in particular was spouse season. Some people got their spouses, some people got married in 2015, and some people missed. Some people missed their spouses. Do you know why they missed their spouses? Because they weren't ready. And if you're not ready, your spouse might walk right by you, okay? Because spouses have to be spiritually discerned, if you didn't know that. And there's, there's a process, I'm going to do a teaching on that, there's a process to discern whether or not this is someone that God has called you to marry. You can't know it by your senses. You can't look at them and tell if you like the way they look or you like their perfume or their cologne or you like their personality. If you like things about them, that doesn't mean that you can marry them. You cannot discern that in the natural. It has to be discerned in the spirit. And if you don't know that, if you don't know what I'm talking about, and if you're not spirit-filled and walking with the Lord, then you can miss it. 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 You can miss it, you can miss it, you can miss it. So that's what I mean when I say instead of worrying about, you know, the big payoff and the big day and Joseph from the pit to the palace, it might not happen like that. Instead, prepare yourself 
with the skills and the talents and the gifts and the knowledge you already have in your hand and develop it to a higher level. Uh, for example, I know that I can minister prophetically a higher, at a higher level now than I could when I first started, and I felt it when the Lord has increased the anointing, when he's opened up the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God has breathed more on me and breathed more in me than I had when I started. But that only happened because I obeyed. Now, I'm not giving myself any credit, and I'm not giving myself any glory. All glory goes to him, okay, because it's only by his mercy and his grace, and it's his idea, and it's his kingdom. So I'm not giving myself any glory. I'm saying that I know I have grown from where I was when I first started, but it only happened because I jumped out here. <laughs> I know a lot of people are hesitant to start their ministry because a lot of people feel like if I can't start where Bishop Jakes is right now, then forget it. A lot of people feel like if I can't start where Pastor Joel Osteen is right now or Pastor Bill Winston or Apostle Fred Price, you know, but they spent, you know, Apostle uh, Fred Price spent years building his church, but a lot of people feel like if I can't start at that kind of level, then forget it. And that's not the way it works. Remember that the Lord dealt with people one on one. Remember that the Lord talked to large crowds of people, uh, 15,000 people. He also talked to, you know, people one on one. He also talked to smaller crowds. He also went into people's homes. So Jesus himself didn't say, I'm only going to speak to the masses. The woman with the issue of blood actually grabbed him. The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, uh, you know, uh, Legion, the Gadarene demoniac, the man that had all those demons in him, the rich young ruler that asked him, how can I be saved? Uh, the Roman centurion who asked for healing for his child. Jesus dealt with people one-on-one -on -one all the time. So it is incorrect for you as a minister of God to feel like if you don't have this large platform of this large church, or fame or celebrity or whatever that God is not using your life to make a difference that's not true because God himself ministered to people one on one so how can we say that God isn't using us just because you know maybe we don't have a platform of that level okay maybe that'll come in your life one day and maybe it won't maybe you don't want it maybe you think you want it maybe you think you want to be a famous minister maybe you think you want to be a celebrity but what if it doesn't happen but what if it does happen Okay, you would lose your anonym, anonymity. There are a whole lot of things would happen if that happens. So, you know, it might not be what you think it is. So I'm just saying that the point of the scripture is to keep you encouraged to tell you that that harvest is coming, that reaping is coming, but you got to keep sowing. You, you can't give up. And also that to stop looking for it to be this big, boom, mighty change, because once again, I hear people preach all the time about this big boom. One of the reasons I think we do that is because it's people, we like drama. <laughs> we love drama. Don't try to act like we don't like drama because we do. But also, people tend to preach the Bible like it's a highlight reel. Okay? We tend to preach the Bible like it's a highlight reel, meaning like it's a movie. And what do they do with movie trailers? They, they put all the explosions and they put all the you know, scenes and all the teaser trailers and all the all the scenes where something's about to happen and they cut away and all the reaction so shots or whatever. And I, sometimes I think that the Bible is preached like that because people are trying to preach about these big spectacular moments because they're so dramatic. It's entirely possible that you can have a moment that changes your life that's not big or loud or dramatic. So Joseph's moment was big and loud and Job's moment was dramatic. And, and when Saul of Tarsus was stopped by Jesus on a Damascus road, the Lord appealed to him, appeared to him in a blinding flash of light. That was dramatic, okay? But everybody's conversion isn't dramatic. Samuel knew, uh, Hannah, his mom, knew that Samuel was to be a prophet before he was born. And so you know what happened with him? Uh, Hannah and God agreed that Samuel was going to be dedicated to the prophetic ministry from the womb from a child. So Hannah nursed him, weaned him, and turned him over to Eli. And when God first spoke to Samuel, it was very quiet, and Samuel didn't know that was the Lord. Samuel thought Eli had called him, and about the second or third time, Eli said, wait, wait, that's the Lord talking to you. So the next time you hear that voice that says, Samuel, Samuel, say, hear my Lord. And that's how Samuel started his journey. That wasn't loud. That wasn't dramatic. That wasn't some big, you know, where the, the, the valley, 
you know, became a sinkhole and all that, that was God whispering very quietly to Samuel to start their prophetic walk together. You see what I mean? So it doesn't have to happen in a big, loud, dramatic way. It can, but it doesn't have to. That's what I'm saying. So what we don't want to do, we don't want to miss the opportunities that we already have every day because of attitude or lack of development or procrastination or depression. Because again, it's very easy to get depressed and discouraged when you're walking by faith because there's not always going to be sensory evidence around you. And you have to speak to the mountain just like the Lord said. I can't tell you the number of situations I've been in where there hasn't been any sensory evidence around me. And I had to say it. I had to speak the word. I had to say what the Lord said. I had to speak the word of God anyway. And I did see the situation change, and I did see stuff come to pass, but I still had to say it in spite of what looked very, very different. Okay? Remember, I tell you all the time, I'm not preaching, prophesying, teaching anything that I'm not living myself. Okay? So, amen or praise God. Uh, uh, I'm really blessed by that word. I'm excited by that word. So, uh, so I just want to encourage those of you, uh, especially those of you that have any kind of ministry, stop thinking about ministry as church. Because remember, we don't have church right now. <laughs> stop thinking about ministry as church. The word minister out of the Greek literally means to serve. It means to serve. If you're a parent, that's a ministry. If you're a spouse, that's a ministry. That's why a whole lot of people struggle in their marriage because you don't see it as a ministry. I told my son this all the time. <clears throat> I don't understand why people treat their behavior like, like fine china. You only bring the best out when company comes. If somebody coming over to your house, <laughs> you want them to, to know how clean your house is and how good your plates are, whatever. So you take them plates out that you don't use them all the time, the plates maybe your grandmother gave you or that really expensive stuff you got for your wedding, and you serve strangers on that, and you serve your kids on paper plates. I did the opposite. I told my son that I wanted to try to give him my best, not that I didn't want to be good to strangers, but I didn't want to, you know, because I made that mistake when I was a young man. I was so busy, so caught up in the work I was doing at church, I didn't understand my ministry is to my children. So I had to get it right. Okay, and so that's what I mean when I say when when we or pull out right, Lisa said pull out the big white Bible, that's right, the big Thompson Bible with the chain hanging off, when you just walk people over the head and say, You need to get saved, right? So so those kinds of things are ministry. If you're an entrepreneur, that's a ministry because you're serving people with the goods and the services you're bringing to the marketplace. You're trying to tell me that the workers that are working in the grocery stores now are ministering and serving us, putting their lives on the line, being exposed to everybody breathing on them every day so we can still buy groceries. You're trying to tell me that the doctors and the nurses that are still doing what tests we do have are helping people as best they can. You're trying to tell me that they're not serving it. So, so stop thinking church when you hear the word ministry. Your ministry is whatever God has given you to, to give into the world. And that's normally multiple things, being a parent, being a spouse, your career, those different kinds of things. Not everybody's called to apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, bishop, deacon, elder. Not everybody's called to that, but every Christian is called to serve. Do you see what I mean? So stop thinking, stop thinking, stop thinking that if I'm not doing it like my pastor, it doesn't make any difference and it doesn't count and blah, 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 blah. That's not true. Okay. So I want you to be encouraged. And that's what the spirit of God want me, wanted me to deliver to you today, to be encouraged and don't miss them opportunities that you've already got that are around you every day. Okay? All right. When you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there any other prophetic words he wants me to deliver? So here we go. Okay. The Spirit of God says we're going to blow the breath of God. Now, it's a good thing we're online because, you know, I wouldn't do this in person. But something that you do prophetically is you blow the wind of the Holy Ghost. Jesus did it. If you wanted this biblical precedent, the Lord breathed on them and he said, receive you the Holy Ghost. So the Spirit of God told me to breathe. So I'm going to do that. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I breathe encouragement and energy and healing and prosperity and vision onto all those that will receive it. 
that God will show you that you will see that your labor is not in vain. As you can feel new energy and new life coming to your body, coming to your home, coming to your family, coming to your mind, coming to your finances, coming to your relationships. A newness of life has been breathed on you right now, prophetically. So receive it. And ain't no coronavirus in it. There's only Holy Ghost in it. So receive it and let it bless you so you can move forward and not give up. Okay? Let me ask you if there's anything else. Uh, yes, don't forget to pray for those that are going, going through. Uh, we, we have uh, very few opportunities to see people in person now, and we're not supposed to be getting close. We're supposed to be social distancing. But we can pray for those that are in distress. If you know anybody that's lost a loved one, because it seems like Facebook is a litany of obituaries. Now, have you noticed that? Have you noticed that it seems like every other post is somebody announcing somebody dying? So don't forget to pray for those that are going through. We can do that. Don't forget to intercede and pray and lift up the family to the Lord because only the Lord can comfort us in times like this. Ain't no help nowhere else. I don't care who you are. I don't care your education level. I don't care your gender, your age. I don't care. There's no help but Christ. That's always true, but it's coming to focus through this pandemic. There's nowhere else for you to go but the Lord. Okay? So you don't have to try to fix it. Okay? Lift it up to him. Okay, because only he can comfort, only he can talk to you in your sleep at two o'clock in the morning, deep down in your heart. Only that's the Lord's place. Okay, only he can minister to that. But don't forget to pray and intercede for those families. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. Uh, reminder, I want to tell you that my prophetic devotional for the second quarter is out uh, April, May and June. So that's going to be up uh, next month. Then the next one will be out July, August, and September. So I have one uh, every quarter. So if you want to develop your walk in the prophetic, that's what this journal is for. Every day focuses on a prophetic scripture or prophecy or an experience with a prophet or God himself prophesying. So you can meditate on the scripture and the Holy Spirit can begin to give you revelation of what it means in your life. That's my prophetic journal. So one per quarter, everyone covers three months. And then uh, my music, I'm doing New Music Friday, so I'm releasing my music every week that I have music. I didn't have any this week. I'm working on an EP uh, for my videos, three songs, three videos, because I've edited the videos and edited the songs. So I'm going to re-release them in EP format. And I got, a lot, I got a lot more stuff coming up. Every first Friday of the month is I release a hymn, because I have a project called the 150 Hymn Project. I'm writing a hymn for every song. So there's a fresh hymn for every song. And uh, that project has been in my heart for a while, and I love it. I love hymns. I grew up on hymns, so I'm very excited about that. And I have a lot more things coming, but I just want to let you know what i got going out there. i got more books coming. Uh, i got I got a lot of stuff coming, okay? So, so once again, I'm practicing, you know, what I just ministered on, and that, you know, uh, i got to stay encouraged because I have a lot of stuff that I'm writing, a lot of stuff I'm developing, a lot of stuff I'm doing. Uh, so when it manifests, praise God. But in the meantime, i got to keep going, okay? All right, so again, thanks to those of you that watch me live. Thanks to those of you that are listening to the podcast. Thanks to those of you, those of you that are on YouTube and those of you that are on Periscope. Okay, I will see you. Don't forget to check out my No More Genies teaching. I'll talk uh, about the parable of the 10 virgins. It's on my Facebook page. Look up hashtag PDT, hashtag NMG. That stands for No More Genies. Uh, and you can find all my music on my YouTube channel, Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. Okay. All right, so I will be back. What's the date? The 17th. I will be back in a week next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next live prophetic word. Thank you. God bless you. Have a good week. And remember, in due season, we're going to reap if we don't faint. But opportunities are around us every day. So let's take advantage of those as well. Okay? Amen and God bless.